Well, today we are in our series called By Faith, the Sequel. Here's the deal, guys. I haven't preached in a little while, and I have a lot to tell you today. So normally I would recap this entire series, but I'm not going to do that. So if you're new, I want to tell you we have a website, and you can listen to all the sermons we've been preaching. So go to last week, hear the entire recap from Pastor Tim. He'll, he'll give you a great recap, but today we're just going to dive in. So... The only thing I am going to tell you is that we wrote a song called By Faith, and what we're doing is we're preaching the lyrics of this song and the corresponding scriptures that go with them. And today, we're going to spend our fourth week in the bridge of this song. This is very San Francisco of us. We're stuck on the bridge. Anybody been stuck on the bridge before? Yeah. Do you like that joke? I was really proud of that one. (laughs) Well, we're going to put the bridge back on the screen. It says this, waves bow down, mountains move, demons shake when we mention you. The power in that, in those words is incredible. Well, when we started talking about this series that we were going to uh, go through this and we started talking about the different topics and scriptures that we could preach, I pulled a very childish move. I said, I got dibs on mountains move. Like I got dibs. You can't do it. You can't preach that. I'm going to do it. It's not just because I love mountains. I love looking at them. I love hiking them. Where's my hikers at on my team? I love camping on them. Where's my campers at? (laughs) Not you. You're not invited. But it's not just that I love mountains. The reason I wanted to preach about this is because... uh, A little over a year ago, God gave me a vision right after we launched something called Watchman Workshop. Watchman Workshop is where a group of our intercessors gather monthly before a pursuit gathering so that we can seek God and hear his voice for our church. Right after we launched that, God gave me a vision. And are you guys okay if we start things out a little different than normal this morning and I share that vision with you? I feel like because uh, there are a number of new people in the room, maybe you're new to Jesus and you're new to the things of God, uh, I want to help you out before I share this. Because sometimes uh, the things of God can be a little bit weird if you don't understand them. And we often talk about the prophetic or about visions or dreams, and I want to give you a bit of context with that, because that is actually a unique way that God sometimes speaks to his church. Uh, Back in the the book of Acts, when the birth of the New Testament church happened, when the apostle Peter was preaching, he quoted from the book of Joel, and he said, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters, they will prophesy. Young men will see visions, and old men will dream dreams. When Peter said that, he wasn't just talking about the church in that day. He was talking about the church in this day. He was saying this church, and us as the Father's house, our heart is that we would be a New Testament church, and we eager desire the gifts of God. So sometimes God speaks to us in visions. So the vision I had was at our pursuit gathering in August of 2021. We're in the middle of worshiping and all of a sudden I saw this picture of a mountain before me. It wasn't just me standing in front of the mountain, but it was me along with our intercessors that were gathered. And we were speaking to this mountain and we were declaring the same thing, all of us in unison. Uh, The vision kind of went away and I kept worshiping, but a little bit later, that vision came back. And I saw the the intercessors still speaking to this mountain. Now, I know that in the word of God, uh, mountains sometimes represent impossible situations that stand before us. Just like it seems so impossible to fathom a mountain getting picked up and moved into the sea. But I didn't know what this impossible situation was that was standing before me and the intercessors. I just knew that we stayed in our posture and we kept speaking to it. And as we continued to speak to it, I began to see a crack and a crumble start to form in the base of that mountain. Now, that happened at the beginning of August, but many of you know at the end of August was when our family was hit with a a medical crisis with our oldest daughter, Ellie. We found ourselves in the hospital for a number of weeks trying to figure out what was going on with her body. In that first week when I was in the hospital, I was laying on that kind of makeshift bed. They call it a bed. I'm like, this is sad. This is worse than camping. I was laying there one night and I got a text from one of our intercessors and he said this to me. He said, Robin, I believe the mountain that we're speaking to is Ellie's medical condition. That just hit and sunk in. I'm like, oh my gosh, is the mountain that's before us. Now fast forward to January 2022 when we're still as a family standing before this mountain of crisis with our daughter. 
And it, we were in the first day of a week-long fast that we do every January as a church. And I was sitting in my living room that first afternoon, and I was praying. And as I was praying, I got distracted by a text message. How many of you know it's really a good idea to silence your notifications when you're praying? But I was actually really happy that I got this distracting text message. Because as I was sitting in praying, this message came through from a woman who I used to be in relationship with, but I hadn't talked to in a couple of years. She knew a little bit about our, our situation, but I hadn't shared a vision with her. I hadn't talked to her in a, in a long time. But she sent this to me. She said, I had a vision of Ellie approaching two mountains with the sun setting behind. She lifted up her hands and she gracefully and with such assured power, she spoke. And as she did, the mountains vanished. What was revealed was the sun and a beautiful open field of flowers. It's beautiful. Uh, many of you know that even as Tim has preached and, and shared in recent days that our family is still standing in front of this same mountain. It's been 440 days and we still stand in front of this mountain with this challenge of our daughter's health. We've maybe seen some cracks, but we haven't seen it vanish completely. So needless to say, I'm a little bit passionate about preaching about mountains this morning. But it's not just for my sake. I know that many of you in the room are facing your own mountain. Mountains of a, a marriage that is struggling. Mountains of maybe a financial crisis as so many people have been laid off in recent days in the Bay Area. Maybe your mountain is an addiction that you just keep circling round and round and round. Or maybe your mountain is your child, but it's not a medical crisis. It's their salvation that you've been praying for. I know that there's a group of women that just started meeting last week. They started a prayer group to pray for their prodigal sons and daughters. Now, while many of our mountains, our mountains may take on different names, we all face some impossible situations that stand before us and seem so giant in front of us. But I believe that Jesus wants to show us how to embrace the promise of this lyric and the scripture that inspired it this morning so that we can see some mountains move. Amen? Will you pray with me today? Oh, Holy Spirit, I thank you for your word. And I thank you also that you're here with us. No doubt about that. I pray that you would go beyond even just the words that I say and uh, what you've spoken to me and you would speak directly to hearts. We just open up our hearts. We consciously say we open our hearts to you today and we focus on what you have for us. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Well, if you're in the note-taking type, as, Cass, as uh, Carol inspired us to be, uh, the title of this sermon is Mountains and Seeds. And if you've been reading the Bible for a while, you know where I'm going with this already. Before we get into that main text today, I want to give us a little bit of context that I think will help us as we read. Because a lot of significant things happened in the journey of Jesus with his disciples, but there's two very significant things I want to point out that will help us better understand the scripture that we're going to land on today. The first is that Jesus uh, sent his disciples out two by two to go out and do some ministry. He didn't walk, go with them, but he sent them with his authority to find people that needed healing healing, find people that needed freedom who had demons that they were struggling with, and also raise the dead. Now, the disciples were sent out, and to their astonishment, it actually worked. They saw people healed. They saw demons cast out, and they raised the dead. And then we read a little bit further on in Matthew 17, in both Mark and Luke 9, we read about an incredible thing that happens when Jesus takes his disciples, just three of them, to the top of a mountain. He wants to take them on a hike. Uh, I love this occurrence, and, and if you have never read it, go back and read it, because it's probably one of the most powerful things to read in Scripture. Because Jesus doesn't just take them on a hike so that they can get to the top of a mountain and say they did it. He took them for a prayer meeting. It was on top of that mountain that we read about the transfiguration of Jesus, where his face transforms and they see the glory of God. All of a sudden, the garments, what he was wearing, were bright white, and they see him for his true nature, who he truly was. And then crazy things happen. Elijah and Moses show up and start talking to Jesus. And then the heavenly father says, this is my son. Listen to him. This incredible moment happens. And this all happens before they get to the text that we're going to read. 
They head down the mountain. And what we're going to read today, I'm going to follow suit with last week because this account uh, and what we're going to read is in three Gospels. So I've taken two and I've kind of hybrid them. So I want you to bring your Bible, keep bringing it to church. But for today, I want you to follow me on the screen. This is a chunk of scripture. You guys buckle up. You're ready for me to read a chunk. It's story time with Pastor Robin today. It says this, at the foot of the mountain, a large crowd was waiting for them. A man came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and he suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire or into water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. He re- and then Jesus replied to the, to the father in the crowd, Oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Can you hear some of the frustration in Jesus' voice? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion, and he fell to the ground, withering and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening, Jesus asked the father. And he replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit will often throw him into the fire or into the water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What? What do you mean, says Jesus, if I can? Jesus asked, anything is possible if a person believes. And the father instantly cried out, I do believe Jesus, but help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. I love the words of Jesus and like how intense this is. He says, listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. And then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. And the murmur ran through the crowd of people. And they said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, he helped him up to his feet, and the boy stood up. Afterward, the disciples asked Jesus privately, hey, why couldn't we cast out that demon? Jesus replied, this kind can be cast out only by prayer and fasting. You don't have enough faith. I tell you the truth, that if you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. There is so much in this scripture. There are so many layers. We see these disciples, and they were like, we've cast out demons before, but why couldn't we do that? Here, something was different. There's so much here, and I invite you to go study it out because there's a lot God could reveal to you. But for the sake of time and for the sake of our series today, I just want to highlight a few things from this text that I believe will help us in our faith journey and the mountains that we face. You guys up for that? You ready? All right, the first thing I want to look at today is the honest confession of a hurting father. See, this boy's father responds to Jesus' challenging statement of, if you believe, all things are possible. He responds with this mixture of despair and trust. He says, Jesus, I, I do believe, but I've also got some doubt. Can you help me? And this scripture has been preached about so many times. I hear this scripture quoted. So many people find comfort in it. And, you know, people say, this is my favorite scripture. And for good reason. It's relatable. See, I love reading the word of God and being inspired by the characters that we see in their lives that they led. I love reading about David and how he defeated Goliath. I love reading about Samson, and I'm inspired by his strength and the the courage that he had. I'm also inspired by Solomon and his wisdom. But there's something about this unnamed father. It may not inspire me, but it most certainly encourages me. Because I've never slayed a giant, but I have struggled in my faith. This is so relatable. I believe, but I also doubt. I believe, but I also have some unbelief. Jesus, I believe, but the thing and the situation that I'm facing is causing me to think that maybe it's not possible. See, this father that we see, he had some faith. 
Otherwise, he wouldn't have showed up on the scene with the disciples. He wouldn't have searched them out and said, hey, can you help me with my boy? And he definitely had some faith. Otherwise, he wouldn't have followed the disciples when they failed to the base of a mountain to wait for Jesus to come down from a hike. So this father had some belief. But we also see that this father has been watching his son suffer for years. He probably went to doctors. He searched out people and he thought, can you help him? And failed attempt after failed attempt, his son was still in the same condition. So there was some doubt as he approached Jesus of, is this going to be another failed attempt to find my child help? I think that many of us can relate to that in the room. Now, maybe you're standing in front of your marriage that is falling apart, and you're like, I believe you can restore this, Jesus, but also I kind of doubt it. Maybe the child that you've been praying for, you're like, I believe you could save my son or daughter, but then you see their lifestyle and situation. Maybe you see what they post on Instagram, and you're like, they seem so far gone. Jesus, I know that you're a healer, but the doctor's report that I just got and read leads me to think that maybe healing isn't possible. If you're taking notes today, I want you to write this down. Jesus is more concerned with our honest confession than our faith declaration. He's more concerned with our honesty and less concerned than the things that we can declare. See, this father doesn't ignore his doubt. He doesn't hide it and pretend like it doesn't exist as he approaches Jesus. He doesn't use Christian lingo as he walks up to Jesus and say, oh no, brother, I'm full of faith. That's who I am. No, instead, we see him willing to bring what little belief he had mixed with a whole lot of unbelief. Now, why is this detail so important? It's important because what I've learned about this faith journey and following Jesus is that Jesus wants all of me. He wants my whole life. The word tells us to love the Lord our God with our whole heart, our whole soul, our whole mind, with all of us. So what that means is if he wants all of me, it means he also wants my doubt. He wants me to bring all of me, even the things that I'm struggling with and the unbelief. He says, bring it all. But the goal of giving our unbelief to Jesus isn't just so that we'd have confession time with him. No, it's so that he would help us. As Tim reminded us last week, on this journey of faith, the goal is to go from faith to faith, from glory to glory, to progress in our faith, to always move forward in our faith. And when we hand Jesus our unbelief, because he's Jesus, he is so good, he has the ability to take our unbelief and actually turn it into faith. And Jesus didn't look at this suffering father and say, oh, thank you so much for your honesty, but unfortunately I'm not going to be able to help you today. Sorry, you have some unbelief, and until you address that and come back to me completely and utterly full of faith, then I can help you. No. How does Jesus respond? He says, I can take that seed of faith that you brought me and I can water it with a miracle so that your faith will only grow stronger. Listen to me today. Jesus is not holding your miracle hostage. He is not a cruel father who is withholding good things from his children, saying until you can measure up, until you can be completely and utterly full of faith with zero doubt, then I can help you. No, as we said week after week, that's bad theology. That does not align with scripture and the God that we read about who loves us. All Jesus simply wants us to do is he said, would you honestly bring me what you have? Would you honestly bring me who you are and what you have and let me take care of the rest? See, while the father may have had his doubts, he walked away from this encounter with Jesus with a restored son and a renewed faith. But as we read on in this story, the father wasn't the only one whose faith was affected by this encounter with Jesus. 
So after the boy is healed and the father walks away with him, we see Jesus getting alone, away from the crowd, away from the commotion, alone with the disciples. And he says this to them. I tell you the truth. If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, then you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. I'm not sure if you guys know this, but mustard seeds, which I, which I have right here, they're really small. And mountains, they're really big. <laughs> you guys are so welcome for this enlightening information you came for this morning. Truth is what I just shout to you. Now, oh, m- mustard seeds are small. They're only about one to two millimeters in diameter. You can probably like barely see. Can you see them? Did you see them? You have to look closely. And mountains, they're big. I think we have, oh, okay, it was freezing for service, and I was like, are you guys colder? It's actually a little warmer in here. This is, I call this our air conditioning. Isaac puts this up on pursuit nights when it's too warm in here. (laughs) See, mountains are big and mustard seeds are small. And because mountains are big, it's way easier for me to focus on this mountain than it is for these teeny tiny seeds that are in my hand. It's easy for me to focus on that mountain, for it to capture my attention. You know, for our family, it's easy in this season, in the medical crisis that's in front of us, the vast mountain that's before us, it's easier for us to focus on that mountain. It's way easier for me to focus on it because if you were to look at my calendar, then you would see the blood draw appointments and the phone calls with doctors and the video chats scheduled with specialists and the hospital visits and the procedures and the medication pickup. So it's so much easier for me to focus on that mountain. It's also easy for me to focus on it when every single morning after I pour my coffee, all of my daughter's medications are kept right there, and I begin to dish them out, ready to administer them to her. And then when she comes and eats breakfast, and I spoon out one of her medications that I'm not even supposed to touch with my hands, it's really easy for me to stare at that mountain. When I'm on the phone with her hematologist and he reminds me all the time, at this stage in your daughter's medical crisis, that that blood clot in her portal vein is impossible. It's impossible for it to be removed. It's easy for me to stare at that mountain because it's big, because it's looming, and sometimes I feel like it's overshadowing me. Many of you have mountains that you're facing right here. In this moment, as you sit, you can picture the mountain that's in front of you. And if you don't, I have news for you. One day you might. We live on a fallen planet. This is not me preaching, you know, and prophesying doom that you're going to see a mountain one day. No, no. This is the nature of living on a fallen planet, that there will be impossible situations that you most likely will face in your life. And these mountains are huge before us. But I love that when Jesus addresses the disciples, he doesn't say, stare at the mountain. It's big. Just would you focus on the mountain? No. He doesn't say, stare at the mountain. He says, speak to it. Speak to the mountain. How do I speak to a mountain? (laughs) Hey, mountain. (laughs) What does that look like? Oh, you speak to it by faith. What faith? The little faith you have. (laughs) Oh, but this faith looks small and insignificant. Like, Robin, this is a mustard seed. Look at how little it is. Oh, but Jesus says if you have faith, even as small as the smallest seed known to man, that's enough to speak to a mountain, actually see it move. And I think sometimes we need to take our focus and our gaze off of the mountain that is easy to focus on. And we need to allow our gaze to come down to the palm of our hand where we're holding these seeds of faith and begin to focus on those. One of our amazing leaders and intercessors, you can take that scary mountain off now. One of our amazing leaders and intercessors around here named Lars, um, amazing man of God. And if you know Lars, then you most likely have heard Lars quote his favorite phrase. We'll be setting up in the morning before church and Lars will be on the other side of the lobby and he'll say, hey, Robin. And I'll say, what? And he'll say, I've got a mustard seed and I'm not afraid to use it. (laughs) I just imagine him sometimes with like little seeds and just like, 
<laughs> throwing them out to people. What is that? It's faith. Is it faith in Lars and his ability to speak to a situation and see it change? Was it the faith of the disciples that they had in them for the power that they had to cast out a demon? No, it's faith in Jesus. It's faith in his ability. I hold in my hands some seeds of faith. They may look small and insignificant, but I hold in my hands seeds of faith when I face that mountain. And what does it sound like? What does it look like? When I'm staring at the mountain in front of me and my daughter's medical diagnosis, I begin to pick up the seeds and say, Jesus, I know that you will never leave us nor forsake us. I know that you are here right now in this moment. If you're here with me today, that means you know my tomorrow. It means you know her tomorrow. You're here. Jesus, I know that when you went to the cross, you afforded me healing, not just salvation. By your stripes, we can be made whole. You are able to heal. I believe you can heal my daughter. Jesus, I remind you that you healed me when I was 20 years old, when I was sick in body and I was made whole. If you healed me, I know you can heal her. Jesus, I remind you of every prophetic word that she will stand in front of a mountain. She will see it be removed. I remind you that you said of our family that we will see cancers healed and blood disorders healed. Why would you leave her out of that? Jesus, I believe. And as I stand in the face of doctors and men that say it is impossible, I know that by faith, all things with my God are possible. My faith, my mustard seed may look small and insignificant, but Jesus says it is enough to speak to a mountain and actually see it removed. So I ask you this morning, what mountain are you standing in front of? And what faith do you have held up inside your heart? What mustard seeds of faith are you holding on to? What promises do you have in your heart? Stop looking at them and saying they're insignificant, they're not enough, they're unable. And start being like Lars and speak to that mountain. Say, I've got a mustard seed. Start using them. Sorry, I just threw mustard seeds at you, Nathan. When it comes to faith, we must be willing to give Jesus our unbelief. We must stop focusing on the mountain and look at the palm of hand of the seeds of faith we do hold. But in addition to that, there's another faith application that we see in the truth of this scripture. And it's found in Jesus' second instruction to the disciples when he says this. This kind can be cast out only by prayer and fasting. All right, where's my practical people at? Raise your hand, be proud. You're like, tell me what to do. I have my notebook. Jesus is really simple in this space in his instruction with his disciples. And guess what? We are his disciples. And he gives us this instruction. He says, fast and pray. Fast and pray. Simple as that. When you study this portion of scripture out, you will read commentators take on this scripture. And there's two kind of opposing opinions. One group of commentators believe that when Jesus said this kind can be cast out only by prayer and fasting, he was speaking about the demon inside the child. And he was saying this kind of spiritual circumstance can only be cast out if you will fast and pray. Meaning that if you fast and pray, you'll gain a greater authority and you'll be able to be, speak to greater spiritual situations. But another group of commentators believe that when Jesus said, this kind can't be cast out but by prayer and fasting, he's not talking about the demon and the child. He's talking about the unbelief in the disciples. And he's saying, when you fast and pray, you actually uproot the unbelief inside of you and you will gain greater faith. See, fasting depletes our body of strength, and it actually has the ability to increase our spirit's ability for belief. There's this amazing thing that happens. Now, here's the deal. The commentators can keep arguing. I'm cool with that. But what I see of the truth of this scripture is they actually point to the same thing. Because faith, there's a faith that is found in fasting and prayer that can't be found anywhere else. 
And I know that when we fast and pray, we actually increase our faith. When we deplete our body and we become weak, our spirit is actually awakened in a greater way. So this is so practical today. Every single one of us as disciples needs to have a rhythm of fasting and prayer. Now, I don't have time to teach through all the components of that and what it looks like. I'll give you a couple ideas. Maybe that looks like for you fasting once a week or maybe a couple of meals a week or maybe monthly taking three days to fast or maybe you do a week-long fast every single year. I don't know what it looks like for you, but you need a rhythm. I don't know what your life and your circumstances, but here's one tip from Pastor Robin today, okay? If you're gonna feed, if you're gonna fast, make sure you have time to pray. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just starving, okay? Because it's all about the practicality for this space, I want to invite you, we, if you download our app and you go to our resource page on our app, we have a resource called A Guide to Prayer and Fasting. It's a super easy read. It looks like that. Pick that up. If you've never fasted before, I challenge you. I invite you to step into this. And I know it sounds ambiguous, but would you take my word for it today and just try it out? I guarantee you will see what happens in the results after you fast and pray. Now, last thought, and then you can go eat donuts, which is the opposite of fasting, okay? (laughs) And I'm going to invite the band. You guys can come as well as we close out today. Prayer... And fasting, it increases our faith, but it also does something else. It gives us Jesus' perspective regarding our mountain. We're going to go back to this scripture, and there's something I want to point out here. Uh, Jesus says this to the disciples, I tell you the truth. If you have faith, even as small as a mustard seed, then you can say to this mountain, be moved. Notice in Jesus' conversation with the disciples, he says, this mountain. As I read this, I'm like, logic says when Jesus said this mountain, he was pointing to the mountain that he was just on with the disciples. The mountain he had just hiked up. See, when we're standing at the base of a mountain, it can look so huge. But Jesus was reminding the disciples here in this moment of a different perspective, a perspective that you have when you're on top of a mountain. Guys, what happened on top of that mountain? They saw the glory of Jesus revealed. Okay, where's my hikers at again? What happens when you get to the top of a mountain and you look out? You see the greatness and the magnitude. And if you have faith eyes that see, you see the glory of your God. You gain a different perspective. And suddenly when you stand on top of a mountain, the mountain that you were staring up at looks a whole lot smaller in comparison to all of what God has created. I love hiking around our city. And just in this neighborhood, we could all throw our tennis shoes on after service and we could hike up to Mount Davidson together and then we could hit Twin Peaks. Uh, Maybe we go outside of our neighborhood. There's so many different high places in our city or beyond uh, in the scope of the Bay Area that we could go. Now, this last week I was venturing out and I was walking through a neighborhood that I walk through pretty often, but I decided to go a little bit higher in this neighborhood. All of a sudden, San Francisco is crazy, guys. We have the most dense neighborhoods. They're like sandwiched together. We're all here. And then I'm like, there's the forest. Like, where did this come from? So I was hiking in this neighborhood. I came upon this trail. And I'm like, where did, okay, I'll, I'll follow this. So I start walking on this trail. And all of a sudden, it takes me to this incredible, like, secret garden, I'm telling you, on the side of this hillside. There was these huge, amazing trees with vines growing up them. Like all of this nature and greenery behind me and I felt enclosed. It was actually warmer in this area because it was a windy day. It was like it, it just enveloped me and kept me warm. So on one side, I've got all this greenery and on the other side is these rocks and kind of this cliff that looks out onto the neighborhood that I was walking in below. And then beyond that, another neighborhood and beyond that, the ocean. Now, I'm not going to tell you anything about this spot because it's my secret spot and you have to find your own. Now, I love exploring our city and I I love being in nature, but there was something more significant thing that happened as I was on this walk. See, before this 
before I got to the top of that hillside, I was down at the bottom and I was on a prayer walk and I was praying for my kid and I was actually contemplating the scripture knowing I was gonna preach it. And I'll be honest, cause I really like to be, <laughs> I was discouraged. I was looking at the mountain that was in front of us and I was even thinking about the medication that I've been giving my kid. And are we gonna see side effects? I was thinking about the procedure that she has yet again this Wednesday where we have to go spend more time in the hospital and they have to band her veins because they've, they've been bulging and to stop the, the blood flow from coming up and tell her body to go the other way again. And I was thinking about that. But something happened when I got up on top of that hillside and I looked out all the way to the ocean. And as I was contemplating this scripture, I felt the Holy Spirit say this to me. He said, don't just speak to the mountain, stand on it. Don't just speak to it, stand on top of it. What happened? I began contemplating this scripture and I was reminded Jesus was on top of that mountain. What happened on top of that mountain? The glory of God was revealed. And as I stood on that hillside and I looked out to the ocean, I was reminded of his glory and his magnitude and his goodness. All of a sudden, the mountain that was standing in front of me, I stood on top of it and I was reminded that my God is so much greater than this mountain. He is so much bigger than this challenge that we face. What happened? I gained a new perspective. Listen, I know I preach every once in a while and sometimes I make people cry. This is not a sweet message from Pastor Robin that is supposed to pull at your emotions and get you to cry about my situation. Now, as I was praying for our church, listen, it's November. We have until December and we've been praying for miracles and signs and wonders and mountains that we've been speaking to. And we've been believing, God, you can still show up. That marriage is not too far gone. There is hope for it. That cancer diagnosis, oh, I believe that there is healing for that person. My prayer, my hope for us today is that we would step over the line. Oh, another faith message. No, can we get within ourselves and say, I'm not willing to stay in the faith I had yesterday. I'm moving on. I'm stepping in tomorrow into the greater faith that God has for me. What does that look like for us today? I'm gonna hand Jesus my unbelief. I'm gonna grab the seeds of faith that I do have and I'm gonna speak to that mountain. I'm gonna declare and believe that there is power in the faith that I hold. And as I do, God's gonna give me more faith and I'm not just gonna speak to that mountain I'm gonna stand on it and I'm gonna gain God's perspective let us be the people of God that hold that faith let us not be willing to stay where we are let us move on in Jesus name we pray with me today Holy Spirit we thank you for your word we thank you for your truth and we thank you for the invitation to step into the greater faith I pray right now that as you encounter us and you meet with us here in this space that we would literally exchange our doubt for greater faith. Just see this exchange happening today. We are unwilling to just listen to a message and go out and not do anything different. I pray for new rhythms in Jesus' name, new spaces where we pray and we contend and we speak to that mountain pushing back the plate and saying, Jesus, I want more. Would you take us to that greater faith? You don't force us, but you invite us. So we say yes to that invitation today. And still with your eyes closed and your head bowed, some of you maybe in the room would say, this all sounds good, but I have spent my whole life or maybe these last number of days far from God. So when we talk about faith, I don't even have a seed right now. Right now, I feel like there's this invitation going out to you. It says, just step over the line, pick up that first seed of faith. 
God's calling you, he's here. As Caitlin reminded us, if we draw near him, he draws near us. All you have to simply say is, Jesus, I'm gonna choose to follow you today. Doesn't matter what your past look like. It doesn't matter how long you've been away from him. But right here, right now, you can say, I wanna commit my life to you. So right now, I wanna invite you to do just that. And because we're a family around here, we don't want you to make that declaration by yourself. So if that's you, we're gonna inv- I'm gonna invite you to pray, but we're gonna pray along with you. So church, let's lift up our voice and say, Jesus, I choose to follow you today. I'm leaving my past behind and I step into faith. I believe you are who you say you are, that you died for my sins and you resurrected. And I choose to be your disciple today. Help me to follow you all the days of my life until I see you in eternity. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we give it up for those making that decision today?